All right, it's 9.32 and we are um, running the Board of County Commissioners Rio Blanco County at 17497 Highway 64, Rangeley, Colorado, 81641. Um, this is our work session. This meeting will be live streamed on our YouTube channel. Work sessions are intended to provide opportunities for the commissioners to study difficult issues, gather and analyze information, clarify problems, or give staff direction. No official decisions will be made. Work sessions are on a floating docket. The schedule is provided for informal purposes only. Sessions will normally be considered in the order in which they appear on the schedule. However, all times are approximate discretion. Additionally, the board may alter the schedule, will take breaks during the meeting, or continue an item for a future work session date. So with that, we will get started with IT legal um, website and agenda directions. Want to start? Well, I'll just. One of the things that we talked with is um, doing moving the public comments and all that. Like on your agendas today, you'll see that it's got the spirit, the heading um, that basically. Uh, any member of the public may address the board on matters within the jurisdiction of the board. If you're addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you are requested to make your comments when the board takes that matter. And then please limit your comments. 
rather than making that statement, if we try to streamline the meeting, it might be better to make that like as the very first thing so you call to order and then take the public comment. Um, I mean, it's up to you guys the way that you want to do that. The reason why is for if we do, you know, end up continuing the live streaming or whatever like that, we can make it's going to be easier to put all those comments at one time rather than as each item comes up. Um, but that's just a suggestion that we had. And didn't we discuss this? A while but I don't know that we got an yeah. actual agreement to go ahead and do that. So I. And, and I was thinking more that we were trying to do the public comments during the last portion of the work session, so they didn't have to be uh, a live stream as part of the official record. So we wouldn't have 14 people up there, especially 14 people that are that are somewhat agitated that they've got to try to uh, caption, post caption it accurately uh, during yeah, that live stream portion. The ADA yeah. The ADA no, compliance that. issues is the, what, the, what we're doing is trying to make that live stream as easily to be ADA compliant. So somebody from New York that's seeing that the caption, the closed caption is wrong, uh, doesn't come in and sue us on it, that we can, it's easier for, for Sky or whoever does it to, to do a, if we, we stick to kind of the agenda itself, and not have all of these extraneous comments outside of that, that he can he can make sure that those captions are are accurate at the time we're letting them go so there's less errors and less chance that we're gonna get popped with an ADA complaint. So how is that different at the end than it is in, during the, the uh, session? Well, we were talking about not live streaming the work sessions anymore, that, the, that if they wanna participate in work sessions, they could come here or they could even call in and listen. But they wouldn't be on a on a video. We yeah. wouldn't be preserving it through YouTube. Yeah, through YouTube. Right. But if I understand, you're just wanting to move the public comment from the issue to the end. No, on the the, the end of the work session, rather than during the issue during the okay. meetings and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. so all the back and forth and stuff that we really can't plan for happens prior to, so instead of your work or your meeting starting at 11, it may start at 12 because there's so much more public comment, but then you get that all out of the way. And there's a few other counties that stream that do that. Um, so you'll watch their meeting and there's a lot of public comment up front. And then once all of it's done and they kind of hash it out, they go, okay, we're starting our meeting. Then they yay or nay, they go through everything and it's, their meeting is like, Ten minutes long, five minutes long. It's just real quick. They just get through everything, but all the discussion. And that's, that's the only portion we would stream, so that it's easier to make the eight-day plan. But we still have them where they can call in and listen if they want yeah. to. Yeah. 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 So so not we're talking about the the, uh, the public concern or wanting to hear some of these comments. What are what are we cutting out? We've talked to. Um, so we will stream the board meeting, just that section where you guys vote on or say which way you're going to go. Uh, we've talked to the paper and they're willing to talk about them streaming all the rest of it on their site and we're not responsible for what they put up. So no ADA compliance or anything that. So the, the public will still be able to listen to everything. It's just not a big portion of it's not coming from us. We're only putting out the actual meeting. We'd let anybody who had a reason to stream, so the paper. But I, I did talk to, to Nikki about it, and they were very interested in doing that. We can't enter an agreement that they're going to do it for us, but if they want to do it on their own and it helps them have it on their website, they don't have the same ADA requirements as we do as the public entity. And, and you, you can legally have a link to their site on ours. Well, or, or something that where they need to know that they can go to their site in order to do that. Uh, I don't know. Are, we're not responsible for links under that new. I think we list. just say like because we're gonna have we're gonna Google Meet all the work sessions and everything in case somebody can't be there in person. So we'll just all automatically send the paper a link to go in and then they shoot it from there. So we can say, you know, we uh, this is live stream through the. Paper. So you're you're pretty much worried about this ADA compliance stuff that isn't going to start until 24. And are you aware that they're doing a cleanup bill this year? That's all gonna that's all gonna change. I hope so. 
Yeah, they're do, they're doing a cleanup bill this year, and that's all going to change. It's going to back off a whole bunch. Yeah. I, I wouldn't get too too excited about it until this cleanup bill. Is it under the what? You know the. It's not under the same bill number, obviously. Yeah, sure. it is. is um, because we talked about it on Friday. I didn't. I don't think I wrote it down, but I think it is. I I know that they are introducing it next week. Well, this week. Okay. Okay. They are wanting the, to do so some cleanup on it. Mm -hmm. CCI was having a, a deal on it, and they're gonna they're gonna back off that. Oh, I hope. I hope so. That's the horrible one that we have now. That changes everything, so don't worry about it until that comes out. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you need to get excited until that new bill comes out and we see where we're at. Yeah. So then we want to keep public comments exactly the same, or do you want to move that to the beginning of the meeting? Or do you want to just let them as items come up on the agenda? From, I'm just on the rec board, ours is always at the front of the meeting. And so if someone's got the agenda, they said, I got a problem with your business day, blah, 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 blah. But where we do it this way, we actually say, okay, now we're going to do business day. Do you have any problems with business day? What and that's counties what did you watch that do where they have public comments? Send you a list of the ones okay. I would like to watch those yeah, and just see how smooth the meeting is. Yeah, is, is that effective or, or not? All my other entities have a, it's not, you know, not worried about ADA, but they have it either at the beginning or at the end and say, okay, all public comments shall be done on, on this, on this time and the limit to three minutes per person, five minutes per issue. So this is the only entity that I represent or that I've seen that does it the way we do it, where we let anybody uh, uh, talk pretty much however much they want to about any subject. Now, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that that's I think legally you can do it either way. You can limit the public comment to a specific section, and then that way your meeting itself is not interrupted as much, or you can do it the way we do it. Um, but most of the ones I've seen have been a, a, a defined public comment period where they can make comments on anything, either if it's on the agenda or if it's not, if it's just something that they want the commissioners or board of trustees or town council to know. Do they have to sign at the beginning to get up? Usually, what they do is they have a have a, a sign in sheet, mm -hmm. and then they they sign in for it. Only mostly so we can identify who they are, um, if anybody, uh, so we don't have comments out there that we don't know who gave them. I would like to have it at the beginning to hear all the arguments, pros, cons, good, bad, ugly, ahead of time before we voted on it. Great. I think it'd be more effective that way, probably. I think that'd probably make uh, the clerk and recorder probably a little easier on her minutes, also. Um, she has to try and figure out who said what and, you know, was that important, you know, for each item versus all at once up front. And so if we did it up front, we wouldn't be doing it then for each individual item at that point. Right. And then you just basically, if somebody wants to talk to Matt, said, no, you had your opportunity to during the public comment provision. And so it would just be the three of you and whoever you felt you needed to have give you any kind of testimony or other, other, you know, I mean, you can always invite people during that mission. So if you've got somebody that has a specific knowledge that you feel is important to hear from as you're deciding the issue, you can always do that. But then you let this guy know, hey, this is going to happen so we can prepare for that if we do have the same ADA issues. I got to hope we can do away with some of those. And, I, you know, really, I kind of like the, the the fact that the website can be more inclusive, and I think the bill that they have it now is going to cause a lot of entities to to actually become less transparent. Not because they want to be less transparent, but because of the the potential liability of trying to comply with that new PPA law. Because it's easier to say, okay, if we're not required to do it, we're not going to do it because we don't want to get sued because we did it wrong. I'm all right with that. I think it'd be a good idea to have them sign up so that we can mm -hmm. be organized. Agreed. So would they sign up then through you or how they or can, just or at the beginning? At the beginning of the meeting, that at least the rec center just says, is there anyone on the phone or anyone in person? And then they, you know, if they're in person, of course, it's easier to get them to sign up and have a list there. Um, but if they're on the phone, they can just identify themselves. And then that way you could call them and order 
that would also, one of the things we've gotten into is the back and forth. And most boards that I've looked at do say that it's not, you know, the public comment period is not a questions and answers period. Why did you do this when that? And okay, well, I did this because of that. And then, well, what about this? It's not a questions and answer time. It's time to make your opinions known. So I don't agree with item number B because of blah, 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 blah versus you guys have to go back and forth and say, justify that and yeah. go back to the Bible times of, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, I okay. like having it at the beginning. Okay. So yeah. we can try it if it, I mean. You can always change it. Right. Yeah. I think we need to. I think that well, and you, especially you guys, if you have something that you feel like you need more information, as the board, you always have the discretion to say, okay, we're going to give you another couple of minutes because we understand this is a complex issue and that you haven't had time to, to finish it. The thing it's meant to stop is so you don't have, uh, I'm saying the same thing, they come back and say the same thing, they come back and say the same thing as they did, and so you don't have that. Yeah, filler buster and you're just wrote, you know, the, the cylindrical. Do we let other people give their time to somebody else that they want to speak for them. I mean, because I know that that was something that we talked about at CCI was people giving their allotment time to somebody else. So they might have a representative for that group. And so then do we well, limit that? Well, we, we, if you do it three per, per uh, uh, person or five per site, then the maximum that site should have is five minutes if you're, if you're strictly complying with that. So, so if somebody comes in and uses their full three minutes, then the, and somebody wants to argue on the same side, they only have two minutes left of that. So it, it and it's up to you guys to develop your policy. There's no legal way that I, that I can just tell you how the entities and what I've seen done. But as far as I know, there's nothing on the legal side that says you have to do it a particular way. A lot of a lot of them just basically have a public comment section that limits them to this period. They they leave a sign-up sheet in the back, and they sign up as they come in if they want to speak. And you know, most people that are regular meeting attendees will know that if they want to speak, they just sign up on the thing. And if they stand up, then all you have to do is ask them, "Did you sign up?" And they say, "No." If you if you want to, you say, "Okay, we'd like for you to fill out our sign-up sheet when you speak." Just curious on your board, do you do public comments like at the beginning or through each item? At the beginning. And then they do, you know, they ask more questions during that item if needed. You know, so ours is pretty informal. But we don't have a lot of public input. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, for the next agenda, then I'll we'll flip that and see how that comes out. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we are a little bit early. The next one is Easter 911 board with Luke and Ronnie, but. You guys have anybody else that's coming? No, just Anthony. And he's here, so we're good to go. If you guys are good, just Anthony. Yeah, <laughs> just. Yeah. 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 All right, perfect. We'll go ahead and get updates then. All right. Um. So just for those that may not know who I am, which I think I know everybody, which is okay. Um. I'm Ronnie McGruder. I am the Rowanco County Sheriff's Office Dispatch Supervisor. And then uh, Luke is the uh, 911 board president. And then Sheriff Mazzola. He's just a board member of that. <laughs> just a board member. <laughs> <laughs> so um, per our bylaws, we're going to report to the uh, Board of County Commissioners and the Town Council, uh, Meeker Town Council, uh, once a year, just um, our budget and kind of what we've done for the year. So I do have a copy of the budget if you guys want it. Um, if you don't want it, you don't have to take it, but I'll send it down. So, um, so it's it's got 2022 and 2023 um, budget on there. The top of the 2023, don't look at that, our format was wrong, and I didn't catch that until this morning. Um, but as of right now, we've got $201,073 in the bank, and we've got two CD accounts right now. One of them having 25,184, and one of them having 11,982, which totals 238,241. Um, so last year, um, we were right on budget. I don't think there was anything that um, really went wonky. 
Um, we did buy um, radio consulates for dispatch um, in the amount of around, I believe it was $40,000, um, and that was five consulates. Because what a consulate does is they're the actual backup to our main system. So if something goes down, it bumps back over to them. Um, that gives us the ability to communicate as well as record everything that we do. Um, so ours were 25 years old, I believe. Um, and I had one go down, second one was getting ready to go down. So um, 911 board paid for the new, the five new ones along with the installation. So we've got five of those new ones. Um, the rest are just pretty kind of plain and simple line items. Um, there's nothing really um, that we budgeted other than that for like capital expense last year. Um, this year, we didn't budget any capital expense. The only thing that we did this year is um, in five years, we will have end of life for radio in dispatch. Um, so I reached out to Motorola, they got us a quote of, I believe it was around 400,000 to replace those in five years. Um, so 911 board at this moment, um, we've put 50,000 into a CD, another CD besides the two that are listed. We put 50,000 into that. Um, hoping that legislation will continue um, to be in our favor. Um, they're questioning whether 911 funds can actually go toward radio systems or not. Um, so if they pass a bill that they can't go toward radio systems, then um, we'll have to go down another avenue. But hopefully they will not pass that um, to where the 911 board will be able to um, hopefully fund um, some of that radio replacement. Um, and I believe it was earlier this year, we also came to a board meeting to let you know that we're raising our fees, our um, surcharge fees. So on every cell phone, you'll see an increase to $1.97, I believe it is, um, from $1.81 to $1.97, and that will take effect February 1. Um, so we'll be getting a little bit more funds coming into the 911. Um, I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, I have no clue. I didn't look at the numbers or anything. I mean, it's raising what um, 16 cents a line. And I, um, I didn't bring the other. I brought my computer, but I just out in the car to show how much we actually make off of those. Um, but we make quite a bit off of those. So I bet it's increased at least to what 5,000. I think is what um, the increase showed on the budget. Um, so. That will be an increase. Um, What's the Western 911 board's rate? I think it's the same. I thought I saw <laughs> something that it was the same. Yeah. As I thought they did an increase like last year or something. To the dollar you No, I thought I saw something more. Yeah. Because they were, yeah. Yeah. They were higher know. than the Eastern. Mm -hmm. Who was? The Western was. They got an so they were the same as us, a dollar eighty. So two two years ago, we applied. So the PUC sets a rate that you can go up to without having to go through an application process to increase that rate higher. So we increased that rate a couple of two years ago, maybe three years ago. We increased that rate above what the PUC allowed, which was a dollar eighty. They um, approved that, and I believe, and don't quote me on this, but I believe the Western went that way as well. Um, they went the same amount. Well, now this year, PUC approved everyone to move up to $1.97 without that application process. So it's, a, it's an easy process to just tell all those phone providers, hey, you know, we're moving up to this price, um, and then it's effective this date. So we didn't have to go through any application process or anything. You just say, hey, yeah, we're moving, because the PUC allows that. Um, so rather Western did or not, I don't know. If we go above and have to apply for that um, application, then you have to announce that. Like, you'd see announcements in the paper, you'd see possibly even some mail, pieces of mail coming through, but because we didn't go above that, the PUC approved, then we didn't have to do all of those steps. So I, I don't know if Western is jumping up or not. I, I would hope so, but. I believe I they know. do. Yeah. Uh -huh. I thought they were higher than us. I thought they'd done two, and we only was did the quite one over years quite ago. A few years yeah. ago, they were. Yeah. But they were at the dollar. I've been out of that side of the loop for <laughs> two. They long. were at the dollar eighty with us. Um, okay. And and I believe we do have um, Deputy Richens that represents the county on that board, and I oh I'm pretty sure he said that they were going to go up. Um, so hopefully they did, because I mean, why not? <laughs> if you're allowed, then do it. So. 
Um, other than that, I don't, I don't know if there's anything else really to report. Um, like I said, we don't have any capital expenses this year uh, besides putting that 50000 into a CD um, for the future. Other than that, I think we're we're saying the same. We did add a miscellaneous and contingency. Oh, we did add the miscellaneous and contingency uh, line items on the budget for this year. Um, right now, currently, both times the county uses it's called Swift 911 or Swift Reach uh, for the mass notifications um, that go out. And Swift Reach themselves, they have um, changed a bunch of their process and a bunch of their um, or their guidelines. So it's really in a nutshell, a pain to send out a mass notification now with them. 100% a pain. So I have um, been going to a bunch of webinars and stuff, training demos, um, and we plan to switch that hopefully in the near, near future. Um, I've been speaking with Zach at the Rangeley Police Department since they are in, they go together with us and they actually pay half of that um, annual fee for that for whatever program we use. So I've been talking to Zach and um, they're pretty much tell us what you're going to go to. Um, so um, hopefully in the near future, within a couple of months, we can get that swap. So we did do a contingency line item just in case because I don't know how much of a difference that's going to be um, swapping those programs over, but it, we've got to do it. Um, the one that we use now is just a nightmare. Will that require the constituents to have to go back in and re-sign up? And yep, sure will. You're going to have probably a lot of uh, communication that you're going to have to do to do that. Yeah, um, hopefully. I mean, in the you know perfect world, we can pull all the data out of Swift Reach and put it into the new. But I never rely on that until it actually happens. So um, yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of a lot of switches, a lot of sign up. Um, there was an event that occurred, and I was at the beach in the sand. But anyway, there was an event. Maybe you look a little more tan. <laughs> there was an event that occurred while I was out here in Rangeley. I'm not quite sure what that event was. Um, over on Half Turn, I believe was the address, and they wanted to send out that reverse 911. Um, and unfortunately, I think because of a, a bunch of changeover, um, Rangeley didn't know how to do that. Um, and so we kind of jumped in, but it sounds like the people in the area didn't get that um, reverse 911 that should have. A few did and a few didn't. But it's what people don't understand that we need to really be pushing and educating is the fact that it's a geo-based system. So if you live on, you know, Main Street and then you move to Half Turn, you've got to get in there and change that. Otherwise, you're not going to get that reverse 911. I mean, we can't go in and be like, oh, yeah, Don lives there. We need to go at him. Oh, yeah, Doug moved there. We need to go at him. Like, you know, the citizens have got to take that responsibility and change that because it is a geo-based system. So, Can you add a, a paragraph or something, a sentence in your, in your mess to explain that? And we do at the county, um, when we put it on Facebook or advertise it, that is one of the things in there is, you know, if you move, you've got to change it. This is 100% geo-based. So um, I will work with Zach at the, at the Range Lake Police Department to where our message that goes out once we do switch is 100% consistent. Um, and we're all on the same page. So, you know, when it when we do have to switch it and everybody's calling or whatnot, we can all be saying the same thing and make sure it's consistent and inaccurate. Can you do it online, or do you have to call somebody in, or how? Um, the current system, um, you can download an app and do it online, or call us, uh, whichever. You know, the elderly community, um, they may not be able to get online and do that. So they're more than welcome to call us, and then we'll get them signed up. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways. New system, I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be about the same, um, just because of technology advancements. But um, so, yeah. Any questions? I got um, the Marshall Fire. I'm going to suggest, would it, would it be helpful if we put, I know that they're not tied together, but you put them on the back Absolutely. I think any anywhere that we can add or we can advertise, push that education out, I think it is wonderful. It would be difficult for 
Yeah, yeah. Mainly when we change. Okay. Just because of the fact that I'm hoping to change like soon because Swift, the changes that Swift has made is, is going to make it almost impossible for us to send out a, a notification in certain circumstances. So um, I think that instead of having more confusion, we will advertise the current system, we'll advertise the new system. Sure. And yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm just need some verbiage and then we'll get in for a couple months. Okay. Absolutely. Will this help or increase your capability with NextGen 911? No, it has nothing to do with that. Not a bit. Not at all. Nope. So what what really kind of pushed this whole thing is the Marshall Fire in 2021, right after Christmas, just a little over a year ago down in Boulder. Remember that fire just ripped through there? Boulder is getting sued over their mass notification. And um, so they're saying some people got it, some people didn't. And they're really looking at that. So we're, we're trying to find a company that's going to clean up some of that and help us get more people. But also, um, what's available, and we, it can only be used in certain instances, is what's called iPods. So have you ever been, you know, like the Amber Alerts? It, those are generated at the Fed level and that they can send those out. And uh, we have access to that, but we can't use it for the small stuff like this. So uh, that is available, and it's just a matter of, Hopefully, technology getting better to where we we can tap into that stuff more locally. But uh, right now, it's it's on the Fed's control. But if we have a a major incident, um, we can we can use iPods. I mean, Boulder didn't didn't use iPods during that event either. But um, so that's some things that are coming down. And it's geo based as well. iPods is, and iPods even goes one step farther. And um, if your location services is on your phone, um, iPods will also detect that. So you know, say you're in Florida and a hurricane's coming, and they send out that iPods, you're going to get it if your location services is on. But it's all cellular tel. It's just changed things. Where there used to be the reverse 911 was all landlines. And guaranteed, it goes out to all those people. Cell phones, we don't have that capability to, to have a database that we can tap into and say, here's all the phone numbers of cell, people you sell, that, that doesn't exist. Um, so the only really thing is to be able to have that authority to be able to blast it onto your phone even though you're not signed up to it. And right now that lies with the feds, not, not at all. Yeah, they did though at the Marshall uh, Fire, they also did bring up iPods. Um, and we have to once a month do an iPod test to make sure that um, it's going out the way it needs to be doing. And um, we did actually get a CORA request for records um, with all of our Swift 911 stuff um, because of the Marshall Fire. So I had to um, send out the, you know, these are my tests that I do, and they show and they show you successful or not successful when you do those tests. So um, we had to send all that out and um, some more information that they had requested um, because of the investigation. I'm sure, they're having they have the reasons for why they're doing, but it seems to me like they're making it way too complicated. Why don't they just broadcast? If you got a problem near this tower, broadcast that tower. Yeah. I'm like Amber works. Just seems yeah. like they're making it way too complicated. I think it's too maybe based on the fact that not all towers are like the same level. Like we have, I don't know if we have still 3G towers, but say we have 3G towers, that's not going to go out. That mass notification can't be utilized with that specific tower. It's got to be a 4G tower or whatever. So I think tower issues can can be a big issue as well. So I got one more thing to talk about. The 911 board, the Eastern 911 board, the uh, town of Meeker and Meeker Fire District, without the support that um, of those, we wouldn't be able to do what we can do in that dispatch. And as a result of Meeker Fire, Meeker Town, and the Eastern 911 board, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but Luke 
Ronnie are pretty humble, but I want to bring this up and show you. Um, your dispatch center was awarded the dispatch center of the year for the whole state of Colorado. We're going up against the big boys, and our dispatch center was awarded that from APCO NINA. Those are the two big national agencies that set the standards for dispatch. So, again, without the fire district, town of Maker, and the Eastern 911 board, um, Ronnie couldn't do what she does, and we really appreciate that. And it's just, I want to give Ronnie a big round of applause. Yeah. We have we have a, a great team. It's a very cool award. Good job, congratulations. Thank you. And thank you for bringing the town of Rangeley in on what you're doing. Thank absolutely. You. Yep, absolutely. Okay. You and I need to get her about for a mic. Oh, yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Yaquez, too. <laughs> Just let me know when. Okay. Because we've talked, actually, Anthony, Eric, and I have okay. kind of talked, and I've reached out for some, some quotes and stuff. Perfect. Um, but Just let me know whenever we need to get the, that organized. This, this group, this, or this group together. Okay. <laughs> Ronnie, are you taking this? Yeah, thanks, Thank Steve. you. Well, he doesn't trust me with <laughs> Just his life, but not his last. All right. So our next one isn't supposed to be till ten thirty. I'll be out five. You want to take that? I will. I'm going to stick around. I just need to chat with. I do have. So if I can, this is just uh, unofficial stuff. This is the ad that um, the paper has come up with. Where's the ad? I just had it. Um, my computer will stay on long enough to pass that around. Um, so that's what would run um, in color. Um, at, I believe it's on the second page, so it's fairly prominent. My only concern is that particular draft doesn't list out all the different boards, but it does direct them to the website. But I'm wondering if maybe if we want them to change that or if that's what you guys were thinking, if that the QR code, of course, with younger people, that they'll probably definitely scan that. It takes them right to the website and shows all the different, you know, they can pick NCCIC or they can pick the, you know, library board or Q, uh, cemetery district, whatever one. Um, but it doesn't detail um, each one of the boards. But we could also do our regular advertisement like on page you know, five or whatever it is that's in those normal, our normal notice where it lists out everything and we could maybe have her add, you know, see page seven for more details or something like that. I think our county logo needs to be on there. Okay. For sure. So okay. They kind of know who the boards are, are like, requesting for. Yeah, I'd like to see the board, the boards that are open mm -hmm. from there. Just to generate interest. Yeah. We need positions for these right. particular boards. I yeah, so. no, I've seen that a lot in the other jurisdictions too. That you know, we've got the environmental health board. This is what we need. This is the wheat board. This is. Not. And how many positions do we need that too? Like, well, we that's what I'm wondering. I mean, four and some boards that need one. I mean, does well, that matter? Yeah. That could all be done when they go to that other website. But I'm just talking about this generating right. interest. Oh yeah, I, well, I'm interested in that. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, just to right. I will piece. give her some direction on yeah. that and so, have them. I just scanned the QR code to see where it went. Okay. I just took you right to the application piece. Okay. So I think, I think having the boards on there so they know, because when you scan that, it just takes you right to the application piece. So okay, <clears throat> you wouldn't know what board you wouldn't know. Yeah, what 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 you want to go yeah. My, I'm yep. My <laughs> <be a> point. <laughs> <I'm> on <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Anything? Do you have anything? No, nope. I'm good. I agree. If that's what you're looking for, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Anything else? Nope. You are good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, 
All right. So can, do you guys need anybody else here that's supposed to show up? Good. All right. So we're moving on to IT communications with Trevor and Eric with department updates. Um, so the big thing we wanted to bring before you this morning was um, kind of the first step in our broadband expansion project that we had in the budget last year, right? Approved in the budget. Um, when we started building on the project, when we started building plans for areas where we want to expand, it became clear that there's a few systems that we need to put in place in order to plan those out properly, um, along with uh, maybe front loading some of the equipment and supplies so that when we do go to do a project, we're not waiting six months for fiber to come in or, or conduit or things like that. Um, so that's what today I'm going to talk about is what kind of that first step would be of that of that project. So. Um, there's kind of three, I'll call them systems, software systems or, or tools, systems that we would like to put into place so that we can plan fiber routes, um, plan splice, splice plans and things like that um, so that we can plan the network address space usage, you know, IP address space usage, and so that we can um, physically test the fiber and check and make sure that we're within planned limits and things like that. There's, there's, a, there's, so that's the first three tools. The first one is a tool for fiber mapping and documentation. Um, this will let us, let me show you the, I brought pretty pictures. <laughs> uh, this will let us do splice plans so that we can actually see, you know, what home is spliced to what fiber so that we can, so that we can plan that out so that we don't overuse fiber so that we're not, so that we're using it as efficiently as possible and so that we have it documented so that whoever's here working in this position for the next 10, 15, 20, 100 years has that documentation and it's clear. So that's that's the big thing here. Right now, the documentation that we're doing on our network and the documentation we've been doing since 2015 is in a spreadsheet. And um, it's, been, it's been updated by so many different splicing companies before we got our certifications and other, the old, the old operator, um, CFC and the old, you know, the, and you, everyone who's touched it for years and years and years, it's out of date and it's not very useful. <laughs> so um, the other thing, because this is a this is a like a, a three leg stool here, right? Um, we have asset management, so we have fiber vault assets in the ground that is, you know, utilized to make the network work, right? And and so we. We need a tool that that captures that right now. We use, you know, the low hanging fruits always using a spreadsheet, right? Um, so we need that captured, right? Then we need the operation side where, when there is a repair that is needed, we have the the guy in the in the repair truck can bring this up and and open a vault and know what he's looking at or she's looking at, um, and then that way they appropriately either do the fix, complete the fix. Or if they they change, they make a change in the system to make that repair necessary. We then track that, right? So that when they bring up, they know exactly what fiber is going to what, what's lit up, and and there's not a guessing game. And then the last leg of that, of course, is planning for the expansion. So that when we look at an address, we're able to build that within the system, and then that gives us the output and planning for either putting bids together for contractors or doing it in-house. So when we draw that line, it's not just a line on, on this map. It's also, you know, this is a 12-strand fiber going to this vault. This is a introduct system here. And then from this vault, this is going to these addresses. And so then when it comes time to either bid or do that ourselves, we already know what's the material, what's all, what's all in done, what needs to be done for the system. Is this manual entry, or is this something you hook up to the system and it figures it out? This will this will be manual input to begin with. Once we have all of our data input, then it will be automated, where we can pick an address and it will just automatically draw lines. And it's going to be a lot of time entering that. Data. It will be. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no way to step into that world without putting the data in, and our spreadsheets. We could probably put in some of the data that we have, but not all of it. How is that going to take you? It'll be ongoing for the next five years <laughs> to get all the, the data input. We'll focus on the expansion project to start. 
and then and then backfill as we go. And every time every time we go to work on a vault or go to work on an address, it'll be part of the part of the work order to just update the system, make sure it's up to date. So yeah, that kind of a system is as good as the data you put in it. It is. Yeah. Yep. And we could, you know, there's there's a possibility that we could get some if it was a concern, we could get some some part time help, some high school students or somebody to go around and maybe actually update the system the way it should be. Um, we probably get we probably get pretty good data that way. But I think the cleanest way is for us to just go do it as we as we work through the system as we work through. There'll probably be a a hybrid phase in that where um, new construction planning would be in the system and that'd be the easiest. Then there would be as we were able to, you know, backlog that the current system into the into it that when you get free time, start going through this and getting it inputted in and and we'll have to rely on all team members to kind of figure out how we we piece that out. And then, of course, as issues arise, then that'll be a typical procedure was when you get into that vault, make sure what's in the system is is showing up correctly. Make sure that if there's something that's needing to be added, you add it before you ever close that door, you know, close that vault lid and, and head out. Um, and so it's not ideal. Ideal, right, of course, is before we ever put any fiber in the ground, we would have had a tool like this. But with considering what we need to and managing it and then, of course, growth, we got to do it now or it's going to cost us later. Yeah. And for today's focus on the expansion project. Um, the free tools don't exist to do this the right way to plan out fiber lines and and splice plans and things like that. So it's gonna it's gonna cost something. <laughs> what what is this program cost? This one is um, thirty five thousand for the first year, which is which includes all the implementation and pro professional services from the company, and then thirty thousand a year after that. It'll probably be an ongoing cost. Anyway. And is this cloud-based, so it's up to date, so it's not like you're buying the software to put on your Correct. network. Yes, this is cloud-based. Yep. We did talk to them too about exporting data if we wanted to leave this system and go to a different one in the future, and it exports into existing systems that we have, like GIS systems and things like that. It would be it would be piecemeal, but we could get the data out if we needed it in the future. Yeah, if a, if a future board no longer wanted to continue <clears throat> on with this, then so they, they would stop. And then, of course, we would have an exit plan for getting as much as we can out of out of the software. Um, you know, we reviewed three other different or two other different software packages. This one, this one fits. We would we would, of course, send this out to RFP, but this is this is going through the demos and stuff. This is the they're all, preferred one. and they're all comparable in price and um, Actually, this one's a little cheaper than the last one we tried, which is the OFP Insight. The last one I really yeah. had. As much as that costs, I'm sure that you don't. <clears throat> do you have any idea what kind of spare time you're going to have? Or if you don't, if we get six <clears throat> months down the road and you haven't had any time to put any data into that, uh, I think. Hire some people to get it in there. I'd hate to see you buy that and then not have time to put it in there. Uh, if, if I said real quick, we already spend. That same amount of time with the system we have now, deciphering, <laughs> right. trying to figure out where it was wrong. So we spend a lot of time just trying to fix the system that we have, where that would just go into instead of trying to figure out where this one went wrong, we're just going to input what it is. It's kind of easier for us to do that than to go back through 10 different companies and 10 different entries of data and say which one's right, which one's wrong. Um, I mean, yeah. there's sometimes we're jumping one vault over because it wasn't the right data in the yeah. yeah, I would I would just encourage you to watch it and if you need to get some help to get it put in to do it instead of wasting money. Yeah. So during the budget process, we talked about an admin position. Um, if they had spare time, is this something that person could? This is something you have to access the vault and open the case and look at. So it would be you need to be able to like I wouldn't be, be able, able to. I believe you could. Part, part of it's that <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
Um, I like your idea, though, of a high school student. Like, yeah, we've had we, a seasonal summer help. Sure, sure, kind sure. We've, had, yeah. we've had that work for us in the past. We had a high school student go around to each vault and put a marker ball in each one and then geolocate it and take a photo. And now the result of that is, is today, in the middle of winter, I can pull up a picture from this kid in the summer who took a picture of the vault, and I know exactly where it's located under the snow. I don't have to try and... And, and that would be a course and put it into it. I think the, the accessibility to a tool like this is so new to the to the department that I think it would be really great if we were able to then, you know, during budget season for next year, have an honest view of like, okay, you know, we've got this up and going for the last six months. Um, either we're progressing pretty well as a team, you know, we, we just took our slice of the pie and, and, and we're able to do that. Or that would be an excellent time where we can say, hey, uh, help button, we need we need to kind of figure out a strategy to, to leapfrog and get the system at a at a higher level. I think um, I think that would be a good strategic plan on that. Um, the next system I want to talk about is um, address space management. The more people, the more customers that we add to the network, and just the more devices we add to the network. Um, the more we need to be able to manage and plan for those expansions and plan for those new new spaces. And so that's that's this tool. Um, it's a $10,000 tool. It's um, it's another one that's annual. I'll have to... so, so I'll simplify. So this is all IP addresses, right? <laughs> and the reality is that if you, if you double book those addresses, it creates a lot of problems in the system, right? And, and this is kind of how... This isn't kind of, this is how network management companies manage because when, when you bring on new customers, you got to understand where those IP addresses is, what assets those IP addresses are tied to. Um, and that's what this system does is right now, again, we use a spreadsheet, right? And there's a lot of potential for errors. And it's one of those things where we're kind of outgrowing the, the free tools and, and stepping into you know, what we have to do to be a professional network manager. Another thing that, to keep in mind too, our existing system is more than just a spreadsheet. It's um, two different Linux web servers and a, uh, and, a, and a core switch that's command line. In other words, Max and I are the only two people who can manage this system because it's a network engineer level management tool right now. And so in order to be able to allow the rest of the team to be able to help us out, this is, this is a lot, this, does, this lets them point and click and understand the network and manage it moving forward so it keeps it it spreads the load around a little bit for everyone to be able to help and for understanding i mean if if um if Cimarron calls in with the problem with a, a dhcp lease right now max or i have to be available and if we're out on a tower site or if we're on our way to range we can't there's nothing we can do so this would allow everyone to help out so that's the second system <laughs> um the third system is an act actually a tool it's a it's a handheld tool that hooks up to fiber and tells you the distance of a fiber, um, where any breaks are, where any bends are, where any connectors are at, and it actually identifies them for you. And um, this is a big deal for expansion because in order to in order to build off of the end of our link at Stra at Strawberry Creek and Meeker, for example, where um, maybe we want to move into the Buckskin Valley or across Ella States, right? You know those, those two areas. In order to move into those areas, we have to have a certain budget loss that we meet with our fiber uh, system in order in order to add to it. In, in other words, we have to know what we have existing in order to build out new. And then the other thing is, is if we're going to build out new fiber, step one, step one when you have a contractor build out new fiber is that they provide, or not step one, the first deliverable when a contractor builds out fiber is a, is a, a list of all the, the losses. Uh, fiber loss calculations and all of the technical information <laughs> in a report and that's one of their first deliverables well if we're going to build out our fiber we need to be able to have those own deliverables for ourselves so that we can see all right we if we're going to add out in this area we need or if we're going to put this customer on bring this customer on board um we need to put an attenuator here or we need to put you know i don't want to get too technical but it, it helps us design the fiber for the future and and to add people in the expansion this this kind of helps us understand the health of the pipeline before we start and then when we do that right because the last thing you want to do is is 
add on where you, you don't want to add on and then compromise that pipeline, right? And then the other side of it too is, of course, is managing the health of the pipeline. If there's an issue going on and for some reason, Doug or Jennifer is like, hey, my internet's not running the way the way it should or or something's going on. It just doesn't seem to be there. You bring this in and this, this would link into and you'd be able to see, you know, a thousand feet out there's a there's a bin that's not you know that isn't supposed to be there and that might be causing why we have some fiber loss and by the way OTDR OTDR yeah. yeah and by the way this tool integrates with the fiber mapping system we can plug in the details from this into our fiber mapping system and it will pinpoint <laughs> exactly where on the map the bridge is or where the map is. Yeah, so we're not we're not Running down the alleyway looking for somebody who's been digging in the in the hall or for some looking for something that we don't know where it, what it might be. This would uh, this would identify it within a couple meters of where the, where the problem is, depending on how far the overall length is. And again, for the expansion, it is a, it is also a planning tool because it lets us you know it lets us plan for those future loss. Every anytime you add fiber, add connector, add a splice case, it adds loss to the system, and so it lets us plan that out. And you have to be able to do that too. And you would just need one of these. One of these, and it's a one-time cost, not an ongoing. Right, it's like an actual piece of equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that piece of equipment? Do you have to update that every five years? I mean, uh, no, these, this, this kind of tool will probably last 25 years as long as we keep it. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to calibrate it and keep keep it for <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> uh, yeah. As for an example, um a tool like this with that we used for this when this when the school district ran the, the ring and meeker, the fiber ring and meeker back in the early two thousands, that kind of it would still it would still be functional today. Even with all the changes we've made. If that makes sense. So it's, this is a long-term tool, something that something that we wouldn't we would only replace if it broke, and it probably it would probably only need a new one in 10, 15, 20 years. And this is one of the things on how we got to where we're at without having it is, like Trevor said, typically we require this as a contractor deliverable. Right. right. You're going to go to expand this. They would have this tool. They would give us the health report and and what the what needed to be done and and then again if we're going to be uh playing in the sandbox and doing the design and planning and and potentially in some areas installation it's it's one of those tools that that that's what they use it's the industry standard it's how you do it yep. um so stepping out of those three systems, the next thing I want to talk about is um, front loading some of our uh, supplies and equipment like fiber, conduit, bolts, those kinds of things. That way, like I said, we're not waiting six months, year and a half. I just saw a lead time that was 36 weeks <laughs> for vaults um, if we order today. So to kind of front load our, our uh, stock so, so that we can so we can build out. Um, It'd be nice to have it'd be nice to have some of that up front, and then and then that way we're not planning a, a project for 2023 that we can't do in, or 2024 that we can't do then because we can't can't get stuff on the slow boat from China. <laughs> so, does that make sense? As long as the stuff isn't going to be outdated before you use it. Yeah, that and that's one big benefit of using fiber over using um, wireless equipment is that fiber again it's been around. Since We've had we've had systems in Meeker since the late '90s that are still functional. That are it's it's a it's a glass thing. It doesn't it's gonna last a long time, especially with us going underground with it as much as we can. It's gonna last a really long time. We 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 would need to keep take care of it in our drop in our laydown yard out at the Abbott property. We would need to make sure that it's taken care of there. But that's a there's space for that. So out of the weather and we may need to put. A lean to up or something, but yeah, the sun the sunlight's the biggest thing that destroys it. It destroys the jacket, right? The UV does, and so that's that's the biggest thing we gotta. And we could tarp it if we had that. Was, Just was a question: cool. the little Quantum had outside public health. Are they still using that? 
the little metal. No, but we thought that was grant funds. Yeah, no, we can't do anything with that. Okay. Um, and and then this is this is the big meat, right? If we're gonna go, you know, snow melts and we're gonna go into Buxton Valley, or we're gonna go and cross that, and we're gonna start putting fiber in. I mean, we have those vaults. Um, this is this is the this is what we need to start doing that. Um, and then we're buying it in bulk, so we're getting we're getting the cost savings on that. Um, the, the figures in here, the takeoffs, the 10 miles of fiber, the 10 miles of inner duct, um, those are basically based on the spool sizes and and a good break point. So, you know, we end up with, you know, five or six big spools of it, we're ready to go. Um, and so this would this allow us to, to have that ready to go. So this figure you're talking about from the Center 29? Yeah, and, and um, that number can, we can kind of change to fit whatever we need to because it's just do we order 10 miles of fiber or five miles, how much do we front load that project we will use all of this eventually it's um once we have this in stock it's a matter of keeping keeping ahead and making sure that we always have that stock um so future orders would be just to kind of replace that as we go along does that make sense so so we don't have to we don't have to take that big of a chunk to begin with but if we do it's easier to manage going into, into the expansion projects. Does Road and Bridge still have those shipping containers? Or did they sell them when they cleaned? I know they moved them out of the yard, but there were two of them that we had all that stockpile stuff stored in that if it's not gone, that might be a good spot to store that. And what they do there were two of them, yeah. but they're gone. Oh, they are? Well, I don't know if they moved them, but they're not in the location that they used to be. And again, kind of tying to the, tying to the original tool of the, the vitro is as we're utilizing our inventory, that's going into, and so we know where, where those assets went, right? We don't just send out and say, we come back two years later and go, I don't know, we're out. That, that fiber mapping tool would actually tell us how much we need to order based on how much stock we have. So this list that you came up with is kind of your uh, best guess of your expansion in the next couple of years. Yes. Yep. And my guess is in that fiber mapping tool, you'd be able to show, I mean, because we're going to have to figure out how to put this on our books, right, at, at year end, right? Whenever we complete a project, I've got to have that total asset cost so that yeah. we can start depreciating that and all that. And buying it in bulk makes it easier because then we have a single price per foot and then we just run the, the foot length. Of so you'd be able to put all of that information into that fiber mapping tool and somehow we could sit down at year end and if you completed I don't know, wherever right. this this piece of the pie, we'd be able to put an actual. I could pie literally just drag and drop a triangle or a, a square over Buckskin Valley, and, and that project would then, and that fiber map software would then calculate exactly how much fiber I used. And I think it even does cost me wrong, but if not, we just put the price per foot in and we'd be good. Okay, okay. Yes. We generate a report for you. Let me say this is where this is. You know, and that would give you a simple math, what we still have inventory wise yes. uh, in the okay. yard versus what our assets now installed and being utilized by them. Okay. Perfect. So that may be the other thing that we want to look at is um, actually putting this inventory at year end on our books as well. Yes. Um, we're going to have to, you know, do that too. So, um, okay. Um, these price, these prices do fluctuate, so it's up and down and up and down. It depends on these. These, are, these have been hit pretty hard by the. Uh, they got hit pretty hard. By <laughs> so what this is today might not be what it is literally tomorrow, <laughs> and it may go up or down. It's been crazy. Yeah, this is just a lot of verbiage. This is kind of what I've already said. The deliverable of this initial project um, would be the mapping software, which which would include the ability to do reports, um, keep inventory, and then plan all that stuff. Um, a manageable um, 
IP management system for the for the network. Um, and the, the materials and tools, of course. So that'd be the deliverables. Um, the the goal is too is so that there's there's accountability to this, right? That that we can set these these benchmarks and kind of measure against because you know. We have a lot of ideas right now, and when, when in this last budgeting season, we propose those ideas. And and the thing is, is we need to keep measuring against whether those are the right path. Are we doing the right thing? Are we getting the right outcomes from from our efforts, right? And, and that's really where on the deliverables, we want to make sure that you know when we sit back again, and and you know like right now is a good time because. You know, in six months, we're going to be right in the budgeting season. That's a real good time to do a health check on some of the things that we've sold to you guys on. This is the path we look. And then and then it's not just our opinion or how well you like us. It's like we're playing like big boys, right? And we're getting measured against against these these things. And so um, that's the goal also with, with how this is set up. So what is the total of this stuff? Is this... I'm assuming that you budgeted this and it's coming out of a certain area that you yes. budgeted for that area. So we budgeted last year for fiber expansion, 740000 I believe. Um, and the idea was that not knowing what all the projects would be yet, that we would come to you with each project to right. get approved right. for that. Now, this project is about 195000 31, so about, about 200000 you told us today. Yes. For year one, right? Because right. next year we'll have to figure out budget for yes. the additional 40, right? Yep. For that software, because that's a yearly right. cost. So yep. that'll be in addition to current year operations, you'll have an additional, let's just call it 40 grand a year. Yes. Out of, and then the the uh, IP address management. That was 10, yeah. so 30 and 10. Yeah. Yep. But that all comes out of the communications fund. Yeah, we'll um, yeah. Yeah. we'll just have to see where kind of fund balance and stuff comes in at this next year to figure out how we can reallocate that. I don't think that I talked to Trevor a little bit yesterday, and um, with our current revenue that we have budgeted, I don't really think we accounted for you know the new fees that I think you guys are adopting a new fee schedule and stuff today. So depending upon that, and then um, you know customers to come over to us or not or I mean it just we're gonna have to really see a year kind of where we're at with all of those new changes I think 2024 will present us with better budget figures of how much revenue we're actually looking at to be able to really decide okay we've, you know we can put a hundred thousand away or we can repay that 740 with 50 grand you know per year um right now I think it's all the best guess shot in the sky type thing until we actually have those figures to know where we're at yeah. and this is kind of the baseline to move forward with, with any expansion project um we could put the the fiber and conduit into a, a like a order just enough for buckskin valley and put that into a project but i think then we're going to run into lead time problems and we're going to run into back orders and who knows it would be really hard to plan a, a project without having that Already in place, ready to go. Answers a lot of the unknowns, you know. And then, you know, we're able then to sit there and go, okay, when we plug in the plan for Buckskin Valley, we okay, this is the linear footage, this is the ball counts, this is the thing. Um, and then we apply, of course, the price that we paid purchasing that that material. And then from there, then it it simplifies it much more because now it's just equipment and labor to get it into the ground and. It's, it's clearing that picture up where we definitely didn't have a clear picture, you know, six months ago when we were talking about these ideas. Now it's it's knocking down as many unknowns as we can, and we say okay, um, and then we get the the notice to proceed, and and we we move forward with those sections. And again, trying to do this as if, you know, this is how you know larger kind of network management institutes do it. And then costing is easier because you just you bought it in bulk. So how easy to cost out from that. And as a matter of fact, it, it's very difficult to buy some of the stuff that we're buying in less than ten thousand foot spools. 
they have to cut it off for you, they're going to charge you, charge you for that. Um, so I guess today we're looking for direction on that, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Just need to go to approve. No, because um, you'll actually approve it during the supplemental, the first supplemental of the year. So we just kind of need direction from you guys as yes, kind of move forward with that plan, or no, we'd like to see changes to it. And then I can go ahead and file the paperwork and get the transfer of that 195, 250, let's call it or whatever it is, over to the communications fund. And then they can start actually, you know, purchasing or doing what they need to. And you said some of some of the systems will go out for bid or anything will follow procurement policy. So, okay. you know, we, we will have to send a, a individual RFP out for the fiber management tool, even though we like, you know, this particular one that we use in this demonstration, we still need to to send out a proper RFP for it and do evaluation and selection off of it. And then, of course, then that agreement would come in front of you guys to to sign off on. Um, same with with any of the, the tools, like anything we've shown you today would have to follow those those formal RFPs. And then once we, we have selected a winning bidder, then those agreements would come in front of you and then you, you guys would sign off on the final yes for purchasing this or well just the that first one would have to actually go out to formal right because you yeah. have up into fifteen thousand now. So yeah. your second two you would just need two quotes on those however the contract yeah. would need to come before the board and you guys would sign off on those contracts um but eight thousand to fifteen thousand we just need two quotes for our um procurement policy um convince me that you have the space and the whatever to take care of this inventory without it getting damaged because of time or weather or sure. no place to put it. Do we yeah. have a place to put it and can take care of it? We do. The Abbott Yard uh, over um, by the airport in Meeker yeah. has enough has enough ground space. Um, like I said, the only thing that this fiber is outdoor rated. Um, the only thing that it's not rated for is a UV. So as long as we can cover it with a UV tarp or a shed or a container, we'd be fine. We also have space inside the Back side, the back end of the uh, Abbott property, there's a big garage. And if we need to move some of our stuff around in there, we can probably fit most of this in there too. We need to do some housekeeping there, do some cleanup a little bit. Uh, we've also looked at a couple different ideas of uh, getting a couple connexes. One of the things that I always liked was connex, and then you do a shed style roof between the two of them. You get a nice alleyway to protect that. Um, we've discussed that. You know, a couple different options there, like you said, like doing some house cleaning, keeping clearing out the back area. Um, well, on, yeah, with, with any of the inventory like that, you've got to have it accessible and know what you have. So that's going to take yeah. organization. Can you utilize the back of the Abbott building where the fiber was yes. years ago? Yes. So that's a pretty big spot. I mean, I haven't been in there. In we years. we got to do some, like I said, we got to do some housekeeping, you know, because it's been a catch all. Right. We, we haven't had, you know, as as other people have, you know, other groups in the county, of, they're like, where? I don't know. Where, let's just stick it back there. And so uh, if, if that fiber showed up today, we would we, we would we would be sent outside. But um, I think with some housekeeping and stuff like that, we could uh, wreck out that area and, and we'd have a, a good space for storage on the most vulnerable parts of it. And then we can we can look at what some of the long term. You know, you're in control of that space. We share it between us and Roden Bridge, but yeah, we own it. It's our, it's our space. And search and rescue. And search and rescue, but you guys got the other side of the yard, so. Yeah. I'm heading on. <laughs> Make sense, everybody. Any, any more, it, any more yeah. questions? I'm good. Okay. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so did those shipping containers uh, no, were no, they're used. They're used? Anthony has one at the gun range and where do you send that one? 
So they're both at the gun range. They're both at the gun. We've got big one at the gun range and shared with um, CPW and uh, the range shooting club. And then there's there's a smaller one that's totally ours. We use that for all of our um, shooting but targets and all that kind of stuff. Those were the ones that were at the old shooting range, right? Correct. So they no, no, they're not the little one. The big one was at the shooting range. We also had a little one that was in the storage yard, you know, where our impound lot was up above Road and Bridge, yeah. right there on um, <clears throat> Barfield. Mm -hmm. That was moved out because that's got all of our latest, greatest shooting stuff in it. That big blue one that's in that yard is owned by the OHV club. That's not. But there were there was two down behind the sand shop. Or the old sand shed that we had all the stockpile stuff in on the onset oh, of COVID. <clears throat> it was blue and gray, I think. There were two of them. They were smaller. I think the city, one of them was the city's for, the, for their Christmas decoration. That was the van trailer, the semi trailer. But, We're looking. Okay. Because <laughs> that might be a solution. <laughs> I know we, used, this. we used one for many years for our um, financials, but I don't know what. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's the one that because when we got that all that oh. stockpile stuff, there was a bunch of old like three ring binders. It didn't have no, it didn't have any paperwork in. It. Oh, I, I'm but, like I uh, thought we cleared it. No, all. <laughs> it, it had like old shelves and but, yes. stuff that we had yes. around, but there was no paperwork in it. Up the back of the private shop. That's a pretty like we can fix the garage door and we can pull in with our trailer, fix up a spool, and leave if we pick all that up, right? Yeah, took that building, what would you want to call it? Storm type of thing, it fell halfway up, halfway down. Oh, it, it, it's your stuff. We have, we have some housekeeping to do. Maybe Anthony could let you use some of those cells for. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the road ridge sand shed would work really good for storing all What we can do is we can also put some pricing together for some some connexes and, and, and something to, to include in this so we're not being uh, too naive on, on what needs to be done. If that's a priority, we can circle back and, and get that plan together. and. And present that to the board too, because uh, we, like I said, we have some time before we're able to get. <laughs> Even if I ordered this stuff today, it would be a while. Yeah, so we can we can definitely circle back around and deliver you guys a plan for long term storage of, of, of inventory like this. All right, we will break for a little while we will be coming back around at one o'clock for right. one more um work session with um representative um, megan lucas so we will pick back up with the board of county commissioner meeting at 11 o'clock yay she does